Sanctuary and refuge is good. Yeah. Sanctuary slash refuge is
those restricts him. I know, yeah. I don't like it's those. It's almost like you're discriminating against yes. colors. Yes, that's awful. I mean, what I'm saying color. is that you got to reach out to everyone. Use friends. Use, sure. It's, it's just because if it's a series of it's like a whole six months of poets, then you poem? just used. Well, yeah, but it's good to reach outside. But some of these poets have branched out. A lot. Is there a reason that you're arguing against using other people other than poets for this series? Does that mean because other people? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. People who are people. A little of that. I agree with you 100%. People who are and, people in your life. But it's also giving them a different platform to see another side of it. I get it, but you don't want to do a whole season of poets. No, I know, I agree. a whole season of poets giving stories. I can't work like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. She decided to have a kid like on her own. 
love it. Um, there is a bathroom right there to I open it. Oh, oh there is seltzer and ice cell. So, um, oh, go to the bathroom, you should put it, pop it open. There's a toilet, I swear, there's light in there, and there's uh, toilet paper. <laughs> Oh, it's being, it's, it's like being installed in two days. Yeah. You're standing in a gallery. How are we doing live? You're in a gallery. You shared mine. This is just cool. You're, you're, look at this. It's it's this is I am a gallery. You are. You are. Uh, uh, it's the Adonis. Woo! We the blackbird.
Does anybody have a problem that I'm playing Aretha Franklin all night long? No, it's still not the funeral. That's not the funeral. That's still not the funeral. I thought you were still playing the funeral. This is her. You mean like the funeral is going to go on? The funeral is still going on. I'm thrilled about this. Yes. I'm really happy about that. That was like, it is good. Okay. I mean, like, I like it. I thought it was good. I thought it was good. I thought it was good. I thought it was good.
and they tell new stories, and it's unscripted. It doesn't have a theme. Um, none of it's scripted, but none of the, the last. Uh, so if you may have storytellers from tonight that will be at the finale at the end of this season. This is the second week of the season five. So we got a little bit to think about. Anyways, there's a woman that came up to me afterwards, and I'm involved in a couple of things. Shabina and I both do a poetry event as well, and I've been involved in some of the, and, and she thought, well, what does a person like you consider to be power? And I'd never been asked that question before, and so that's how the theme came about. My quick answer was, getting the fuck out of the way. <laughs> Feels like power to me at this point as a white guy in America is is being able to say, here's a door, let me abandon that door, and anybody that I think is ready to rush through that is and that's not and that's not a pandering question. I'm not or answer. I'm not actually meaning to, to say that like, oh no, you're great white dude. <laughs> I really do feel like if you have eyes and you can see people coming towards the gates and they're ready, then there's a powerful moment. And, and that's part of, you know, me not hosting this and being, and I'm gonna stop talking to you, but I'm gonna take the power away from our wonderful co-host. That's how that question yeah. came to me. Yeah, and so I thought, wow, what do you consider power to be? What a fantastic idea, especially in this political climate. You know, it's affecting every area. Even if you're an artist, let's say you're not even, even scientists are getting up and saying, wait, hold up, scientists, come on now, they're into science and numbers and stuff. <laughs> Oh, hey, you know, it's not real. <laughs> 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 that being said, that, it was just a great topic. Like, wow, anybody can speak about it. So that's where, it, and what I'm trying to get to is that it's in these simple conversations. You get these stories that come out of, and you get this diversity, and you get this community. And that's the goal of how to build fires, diversity, community, for us to give a platform to people that aren't typically storytellers or writers or poets, but someone that has something really fantastic to say, and you're just like, holy sh crap, that's a person, you know, that has something. Like, we're all here for a reason, and that's why I have the virus here. And I believe that all of us have these stories that, whether you know it or not, you are dying to tell them, mm -hmm. whether it be over coffee, or whether it be around the kitchen table during Thanksgiving. So we all have stories to tell, and this will give um, all of us are not meant to do that. So I guess we're going to start. And also, that room is right there. I swear to God, <coughs> in that door. Just <laughs> use your foot to open up the bottom of the door. It's a small time. There is toilet paper and there is light. And it's an art exhibit in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> so it's perfect. It's so, perfect. So <laughs> I promise no one is going to come and get you. Any gallery Maybe. I've ever been at. Uh -huh. A couple other things. Uh, there's going to be picture, pictures taken. If you don't want your picture taken, we're going to take a picture. There's going to be quotes taken from your stories. If you don't want your quotes put up on the internet for every your mom to see, then uh, we will not put them up. And you are live streamed right now. So if you want the live stream turned off, if you have a very intimate story, we don't have tissues, and we can turn off the uh, um, the live stream if you want. Sorry, I just didn't want to not have it. I totally forgot that. Um, start? Yes, we're just going to jump right in. Who's our first reader? Our first reader is... Or storyteller. Storyteller. I'm sorry. We don't know what I know. He just got scolded. We read things. <laughs> no more poets. <laughs> I cannot walk. They did not know what was wrong with me. 
when my mother, when they, my mother gave birth to me, a little bit pale skin, she then said, oh my God, everybody tell her that dark skin woman, that cannot be your child. Mm -hmm. Automatically, love was taken away from me. Mm -hmm. Before I could even know what love was, my sister was born, and she happened to be the favorite. She was dark and beautiful, and just like mom. Unfortunately, for me, I'm sitting down here still drawing my sister got all the love. Which is, I'm not just saying anything bad about my sister, but we talk about love. Mm -hmm. So, again, God bless me, my grandmother, who a lady we call grandmother, said, why is this child crawling, crawling? So there's nothing wrong with her. She's beautiful as the night is, as the day. She's gorgeous, look at her. As a matter of fact, they have an old African saying, when people compliment you too much, you're cursed. So I'm cursed already without love. So love now has put me into something else. So grandmother said, oh, no, 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 not my little child. This little child is going to live. She's going to run. She's going to dance. And she picked me up. And she said, I'm taking her to the mountains. And she took me to the mountains. And she took me to the great gods. And she said, bless my child. Bless my child. So my child can love tomorrow. It wasn't more than two years when everybody saw me, I was running. My grandmother healed me with the goats and the cows and the coconut and the mango and the trees, and I was healed. So love became a thing for me then. Then I came into this country back in 1972. Again, love played me. The kids did not understand where this nappy head little girl coming in. <laughs> Don't know how to speak English. The only thing I know how to say is, teach your bathroom. <laughs> I worked hard trying to learn the language. Could not speak the language, right? But there was a fire inside of me. A fire was burning. The need for me to be accepted. The need for me to be great. And I learned power the day I kicked that girl in the forehead. Oh. <laughs> Because what happened, little country girl, skinny like this, but tough. Because you know what happened when you're born in the sun. You played in the sun, you're strong. You're eating good food straight from the ground. All right? So she kept calling me Frenchie, coconut, Frenchie, coconut. And she played basketball with me. But then I had one thing that my country is good for. And it's anybody know? Soccer. Mm. Hey, lady. <laughs> so after she beat me up, I went backward and I kick her right into the forehead, blood drawn. <laughs> Little did I know in America, the one who draw blood is the winner. Yeah. So now I can yeah. <laughs> Everywhere, I, all the little French girls, all the little Jamaican girls, all the Guyanese girls ran behind me. Oh, 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 Florence, Florence. And all the boys started noticing me. So I was like, oh my God, I'm a star. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved it. I loved that love. Mm -hmm. Then, I got older, parents are strict as ever. I said to my father and my mother, I said, I want to be an actress, I want to be in the light, whatever. No, you're not, you're going to be a nurse. In my country, there's three things you can be, a doctor, a nurse, or engineer, or shut up. Oh. Never listen to everything your parents say because they don't have time for this art, this theater, this view, this running around. My father said, what do you want to do, jump on top of tables and chairs? You going to nursing school, and that's it. So I got accepted to art, music, and everything. Nope, you going to Cloud Garden. So then I gave my power up because what can you do, you live. You know, whatever your parents say, I felt cheated. I felt cheated out of love. I felt that because they didn't love me. I felt like my mother didn't stand up to me because I didn't look like her. I looked like my father. So therefore, she was like, whatever your father say, good. You're going to nursing school. So I went to, actually, it was her who decided I was going to nursing school, in spite of the fact that I didn't want to be a nurse. I didn't care about the sick people. I wanted to look at I wanted happy people. I wanted people around me. I wanted to shine, dance. She was, I saw dreams, things going in my head, little tap dance jazz, and I said, uh-uh, I wasn't born for this. But you listen, you honor your mother and your father, especially the Caribbean people, parents. Mm -hmm. When they speak to you, that's it. Julie, that was my name, my middle name. Shita, you sit. You're going to nursing school. When I wasn't acting right in nursing school, my mother came and bought her belt and came to the school. <laughs> like the half Jamaican and Haitian woman that she is. She said, excuse me, what did you do? You what? No money, I'm going to nursing school. So I went to nursing school. But then love left me. 
co completely left me because I was so depressed over this whole thing until I find a girl, Wanda Rodriguez, who said, oh, no, 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 no. I will help you. You know, I'll help you do the paper on site, and I'll help you, I'll help you. So she helped me get through nursing. Literally, the teacher tried to kick me out three times, but my mother came back and reinstated me. <laughs> <laughs> then, so then there was no love in my life, because that's not what I wanted to do. How could you see this fire that's inside of me that is pushing to be out, yet you want to tame it, you want to turn me into something else, something that I don't even understand. I'm seeing somebody die, I don't care. Somebody's sick, I don't care. All I want to do is dance and sing. I mean, I have empathy, I'm standing there like this, but my heart's not in it, I'm getting away. But then I started crying. Then one day a lady said to me, come over here, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm so depressed, I don't want to do this. She said, who's stopping you? Why don't you take back your power? I said, why? She said, go and do what you want to do. You're in 19, 20, and you sit down there crying like a little girl. Mommy, 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 stop. Who's stopping you? And I thought about it. And I said, she's right. She gave me my love back, just like my grandmother who made me walk. Now this lady came back, an old lady again, and brought me back to a real reality. So I went to Barton, I went to BMCC, and what did I do? I joined the Talent Unique Club. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of, of life for me. Because now I was among all the beautiful people, the theater, the art, the music. And then, so, but then I'm happy now. Oh my God. Then, uh, then there was this guy who said, okay, we want, we're looking for models. So I joined the modeling group. Now I'm learning how to walk. I'm turning. Then, when it came down to picking people, they said, she's too short. One, two, three, four. Sit Again, I'm depressed. I said, what is this? That's not fair. What about me? I've been here six months. Do you know how long I've been waiting to get up on that stage? Then the guy, then the, the, the coordinator could not take me anymore. He threw me a book. He said, go ahead. If you memorize one of those monologues, you win the show. I said, which colored girls wanted to commit suicide? Mm -hmm. um, I wrote, I said, oh my God, this is made for me. I ran and I memorized. Lady in green. Somebody walk yes. off with all of my stuff. Yes. Not my poems and the dance I gave in the street. Somebody walk off with all of my Woo. stuff. And didn't care that I was late for my solo conversation or too fat, too small for my own tacky skirt. The people <laughs> jump up. <laughs> <laughs> I took the show. I took the show. And I was like, God, yes, I love this. This guy turned around and said, I'm going to be manager. We're going to take you to all the college, all the community campuses, and you're just going to do it. But there was a thing, I didn't know anything about theater. My voice was going after one show. I'm like, and then I'm depressed. I'm sitting there after one show. I'm like this, I'm dead. I said, no, I can't do this. I gotta go to school. I gotta learn this crap. And what did I see on the wall? Harlem Theater Company. Sitting there on bare wall looking for me. Like it was put there for me to see. I knew there were spirits working here. There were spirits who was guiding me. Saying, little girl, we gonna get you where you gonna get. We gonna make sure that you get there. And that is how I found love again. Mm. Right there at the Harlem Theater Company. I walked right in there. And when I got there, Mr. James Pringle said, welcome back, Florence Mills. Mm. Yes. Mm. Mm. So I said, Florence Mills? He said, you don't know who Florence Mills is? You don't know who you named after? I said, no. She said, he said, go research it. And I'm telling you, when I researched her, tears came out of my eyes. It was as if her spirit, because I carried her name, engulfed me. And I said, oh my God, what is this? This is some supernatural Haitian woman. <laughs> 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 I would swear that I was her reincarnated. But then again, how would I know? What would she be doing all the way down there in that little country called Haiti? Why would she be out here? Who? They tell me I picked my parents. I said, oh, I don't know. Because when I told my mother I wanted to do theater, she said to me, you won't die. I don't want you to die. Get you an iron nurse. <laughs> how would my mother say that to me? I said, this is strange. What's going on here? But that's how I got my power back. From there, I was able to start my own. When I went out there looking for work, there was no work for black women like me. Just enough, but I was still a shade too, too dark. I was still too short, so I had to start my own. And that's how my story goes, okay? But I found love when I found who I am. When I tap into my own internal self of who I am as a person, then love come. So love has been good to me. Thank you.
um, with pancreatic cancer. And we just laid another queen to rest um, today in a just epic eight hour ceremony of peak black. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Facebook yes. yes. today. It was amazing. Yeah. I was on it all day. It was just beautiful. The collective like power of it. Black Twitter was like all day. Beautiful. Absolutely. I love it. It was amazing. And I can't wait for the memes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so she had a, a journey with pancreatic cancer and shortly after um, she passed I saw this uh, IG post it said we're all just we're all just meant to walk each other home or we're all just walking each other home and so that sort of um, image has, has really stayed with me so she died in June and then around January I got a phone call from um, a friend that I grew up with in church, and she's about seven years younger than me, which, you know, in your teens and 20s is a lot, but in your 40s, I'm not 43, I'm very happy. Yeah! In your 40s, it's actually nothing, because, you know, mm -hmm. in my head, I'm 35 or 22. Yeah, <laughs> and so, um, and she was saying, you know, she needed to talk to me, and in the conversation, she said, um, you know, I know you're just going through this, but my mother just got a similar diagnosis. This was January of last year. So I found myself in a space where I was asked <laughs> to show up for her to help walk her through this journey that she was about to go through, which I was still in the midst of. And then on top of that, to show up for her mother, because her mother didn't want to tell a lot of people what was going on, but still had a lot of questions. So, and her mother was my Sunday school teacher when I was like wow. seven, eight, nine. She was a deacon in my church. So I went through this journey with them in starting in January, going over when she had questions, you know, did your mother feel this? And I'd be at church and she'd be like, hey, I want to talk to you for a second. And she's one of those sort of church mothers who like, you know, she, during the meet and greet, She'd be pulling you to the side, having a little um, side meeting, or I want to talk to you about something. It's like, Lord, what did I do? So then she would say, you know, when she would motion to me, I want to talk to you about something, she'd whisper in my ear, um, you know, did your mother have indigestion? And so I would find that every time that I interacted with her, I had to find some courage um, to be able to just stand and be there also for her. And it was also a powerful um, process for my own healing. On... Last Saturday, um, I got a phone call and said, um, you know, that her mother was getting to the point where um, the, the, the process or the disease was taking um, its toll. She had decided a very powerful and courageous decision not to go through um, any chemo treatment. Mm -hmm. And so, and to, to sort of put off the reality for as long as possible. The people would send a wheelchair, she would send it back. <laughs> the people would say, you need to get your hospital bed, she'd be like, actually, not yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so about a week ago, just a week ago, and they gave her six months in October. Um, and so just about a week ago is when she just, you know, she was starting to fall, and she's thinking, okay, now is about the time that we're going through um, the thing. And so I went to talk to her, and, you know, you could tell she was, it's about to pop off, essentially. And that's what I would tell people, like, it's about to pop off, that's a wrap. Um, and she, you know, we talked, and she wasn't really speaking that much, and we talked about, and I just told her, you know, it, it, it was a, a, the, it was, I had to be courageous in that moment and show up um, for her to help sort of walk her and her daughter to the finish line, really, or a finish line or to across um a line, and I just kept asking her, you know, are you scared? And she was like, no. And I was like, well, look, all I know is if you see, if you see a light, just go and walk to it. Um, <laughs> because she was ready. And then talking to her daughter, like, you know, do this, did you call a funeral home, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. Don't have people around her talking nonsense, shut it down, put people in the throat if you need to. And it's all about you and your mama and your peace. On Wednesday, today is Friday. Friday, on Wednesday, I got a call, she just passed, and she was at home, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna come. And so then again, the courage that I just found, when I think about what is power, what is courage, what is showing up, I can see myself walking down the hallway, like, I can't believe I'm going through this again. 
and I go in and there she is. It's just laid out with splint and there's, I mean, that's a whole other story. Just that process of those last moments and the holiness and the power that shows up when you're transitioning mm -hmm. to another round. Mm -hmm. It is a blessing. It is. it is a blessing. If you're able to show up for it, it is a blessing um, to be in that presence. Excruciating, but a blessing. And um, in terms of showing up, it was about you know, at that point, circling around her and praying around her. And here I am, just about a year after doing it for my mom, saying prayers over a body, mm -hmm. waiting for an undertaker to do the wrapping and the moving. And also finding the strength and the power and the courage to give praise and thanksgiving in that moment. To say, you know what, actually, things say that this is supposed to be something else. We're supposed to be mourning. We're supposed to be weeping and wailing. So I was the one at the door that when people were coming, ah! no, actually, you're going to hold that. Right. <laughs> and you're going to take a deep breath. And you're going to pull yourself together. Because this is about joy. It is about thanksgiving. She is no longer in pain. You have prayed for healing. And she has been healed. Not necessarily here. But this is about supporting also um, our sister. So I learned a lot just in that showing up and just reflecting on my own journey and the difficulty, realizing the difficulty that I had over the past two years. This was about two years ago to the day almost that my mom told me that she had, um, you know, what her diagnosis was and then went into immediate sort of planning mode. And my mother was just like, listen, I believe that God can heal, and I know anything can happen, and what I need you and your brother to be clear about, if this is what the Lord has chosen for me, I have nothing else to ask of him. I have lived a good life. Everywhere I've wanted to go, I've been most places at least twice. So you don't have to do anything for me. I just want to make sure um, that you guys are okay. And when my mom got her diagnosis, she was saying, she was at the point of deciding, whether or not she would teach two classes that semester. And her doctor was saying, you know, no, you should, you need to focus on your health. You need to, you know, she decided she was going back and forth whether or not she was going to do chemo, and she did for a little bit. Um, and so it, that night when we were talking, she was like, well, I'm not going to do, um, I'm going to call Lynn, her, her uh, department chair, tomorrow, and I'm going to tell her that I'm not going to do the, the, the classes. I need to focus on myself. She called me the next morning. She woke up. She said, yeah, when I woke up, you know, I changed my mind. She said, you know what I decided? She said, I choose life. That's courage and that's power. So you know what's going to happen. But she was like, I choose life. And until I can't go, I'm just going to keep going. She planned her, very similar to Deacon Boland, um, my friend's mom and my friend um, and mentor who just passed, a similar sort of path planned her funeral, chose her outfit, spoke to the people. Like, well, it got to the point where it was actually funny. You know, Deacon Bolin, when I, the last time I went to see her, she was like, yeah, you know, so I spoke to um, so-and-so. She's going to dance, so we shall behold him. And I was like, OK, so I'm like a whole conference. <laughs> Same way my mom was just like, um, one of the funniest things. After my mother died, because we had spoken through the program in detail, she also had a wardrobe change like um, Queen Mother. No, <laughs> no, yes. Um, and um, and uh, so I called somebody who was going to sing. And so I called her and I was like, hi. And she was like, oh, baby, I heard. I'm so sorry. I was like, yeah, well, you know, my mother. And she stopped me and she said, your mother already spoke to me. She said, your mama already told me what she wants to sing. Mm -hmm. And I'll be there. You just let me know. And I was like, I'm sorry. She, talk, she called you and told you the songs. And she was like, yeah, I know the songs. And she just let me know when and where um, it's going to be. So again, that courage to show up, to choose life, um, and to not be scared even when you are scared, when everything around you tells you that you should be fearful. That, for me, is definitely power. Um, the, the other thing that I've learned about power is just the power to show up really for yourself. And I think in this past two years, when I've had to walk my mother home and take care of her and then walk with other people as they were going through a similar journey, I've also had to learn just what it means to take care of yourself and to allow other people um, to take care of you. And there was a really funny moment 
I mean, to myself, because I have funny moments with myself quite often. you know, grief and just realizing what's happening comes in waves. And it was this thing where I realized, like, wow, my mother was actually the only person when I knew, when I, I'm a little stubborn, when I didn't want to do something, you know, she was the only person who could actually make me stop and take a breath and, like, reflect on what it is that I didn't want to do. And I realized, wow, there's nobody actually else on earth who has that influence in my mm -hmm. life that I actually will listen to, who actually really knows me, you know, and the realization there, I was just like, I remember getting kind of salty, like, damn, I'm going to have to start talking to people, <laughs> like, I got to share, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta tell people what I think, yeah. but shit, I was not prepared for this, I mean, it's like, you know, the list just kept growing, yeah. and so, you know, that was actually quite difficult, and, um, I'm grateful to my friends and my circle that are here now for showing up. And it was even, I'm grateful for this opportunity because even the process of saying, I was very much going to say, you know, not tell a soul. Um, and it was when Philip, we were talking, and he was like, okay, send me your bio and your headshot. And I was like, I'm sorry, excuse me. <laughs> and so I actually decided to tell people because I was like, people are going to be mad if it's all on Facebook. Right. And I didn't say yeah. something. So again, that process of like, I'm just going to go over here on the, on the side, you know, and like say a little story, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And so I'm just practicing really showing up for myself, mm -hmm. allowing other people to show up for me, and also trying to show up for other people. And it's interesting because in the showing up, in my showing up, I've realized that it's given me a different understanding of an appreciation for people in my life. Yeah. Um, when I look at the past two years, several significant relationships Friendships, not you watch, but your friendships. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, have taught, and and some, those, those uneven friendships just mm -hmm. became unacceptable. Mm -hmm. What you doing? Mm -hmm. right. If I can show up for somebody six months after my mother died going through the same yeah. thing, you mean you couldn't call me? Amen. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. Right. Sorry, you no longer exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, um, and then also just the, the process of re -erect, finding my power in the re erection or redefining of boundaries. And realize that I actually have the power to define and to, to, to establish how I want or how I will allow people to show up in my life. Yes. Yes. Those who take up too much energy, girl. Yes. 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 And it's my and some of them are related to me. You know, and some people just got to kind of step back. And so it's a very empowering realization when I realize, like, oh, I'm actually aggravated about this, but I don't have to be. I don't have to be. That is my, um, that is my choice. So power for me is courage, courage in the showing up, the showing up for other people, the showing up for myself, the allowing of others to show up for me in this redefining of life and what it means and joy and giving and community and fellowship and um, you know it was a if I think back even just to Wednesday it was just a very powerful moment um, and I was proud of myself because I was able to be there um, for Devorah and for her mother even at that even at that point. And I'm grateful for the power of fellowship, which we're experiencing here, and for you guys to um, create and to curate um, this space. And one of the more powerful moments was, you know, after the prayers and the wrapping of the body and the removal of the body, then you crack open the couple bottles mm -hmm. and you have a little fellowship. And I was um, very, that's also very powerful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so all of that to say, we can't forget to show up. Um, in the fellowship, so I'm looking forward to the tape time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
word is sobot, tolerate. Ma told me as a little girl, this is what a woman is supposed to do. Tolerate. Sobot hor dor jora. Tolerate. Keep the strength. Because in our culture, a woman is supposed to be the rock, the foundation, the mother, the God, everything, the home, the power of an individual. But Ma would always say, in order to be this, a woman has to do sabot. She must tolerate. She has to swallow her pain and say, OK, I'll move on, and I'll carry this pain. Either I'll give it to my children, and they'll learn how to tolerate, do sabot, especially if they're a woman. We take our husband's pain, and we tolerate. We take our children's pain, and we tolerate. But for me, I was born here in America. Ma, I don't want to tolerate. I don't want to do this so good. No, no, no. I want to be free, independent, American. Because I'm not in America. No. You're going to tolerate. You're going to marry who we tell you. And you will tolerate that because you're a woman. You will go into the profession we want you to go into. You're going to be a doctor because you're not smart enough as a woman to be an engineer because you have to use numbers. <laughs> and this was my father telling me this. So my mother would say, tolerate what your father is saying. So I always felt this is stealing my power, my individuality, my voice. But these are my parents. I have to do so much, tolerate. But a part of me never understood why. You're not explaining to me why. That was always my issue. OK, if I have to tolerate, why? Because you're a woman. This made no sense to me. <laughs> well, what if you're a man? Well, they don't got to tolerate. You're the woman. You have to care. So as I got older, I hated this word, sobor, tolerate. It meant I had to undo everything that was genuine in me to become everything that was ordinary to society and acceptable. And this is what I was told to tolerate. So with this thinking in mind, I had to tolerate sexism. Racism. People treating me as, hey, color. Mm. People calling me color. Mm. Me thinking that, oh, well, this is my power to be color. Mm. Not realizing <laughs> this is my deficit. Because Ma told me, sobo, you're going to tolerate. If the white person tells you you're less than, tolerate. Mm. If a man tells you you're less than, tolerate. Mm. Tolerate, 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 to the point where you become stone. And I kept thinking, well, why do I have to tolerate when everybody else is living their life? And I never understood this concept. So I got into a relationship where I thought it's a woman's job to tolerate. This man became violent to me. He's beaten. It's horrific to me. But because in my mind I had been trained to tolerate, so boy, this is my strength. This is what a woman's supposed to be, strong and stoic and quiet. This is what makes a strong woman. I stayed in the relationship for four years. He tried to kill me one night. I ran away, luckily. I kept thinking, what is the lesson I'm supposed to learn? My mother's voice kept coming back. Tolerate. Sobolkhod, sobolkhod. Lord Jara. Keep the strength. Tolerate. You will learn something from this. So I waited to learn the lesson. I left this man, moved into my parents' house. A year later, Ma was diagnosed with breast cancer. What am I supposed to do here? Tolerate. So I tolerate. Seven months later, my father is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Wow. Mind you, I don't have a good relationship. Mm -hmm. a terrible relationship. Mm -hmm. As this man told me, a woman's place is in the kitchen or in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But get educated, because we'll get a better dowry for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now he has Alzheimer's. Everything horrible he has ever done to me, he has forgotten. And now I have to sit here with this burden of 30 some odd years of pain of you telling me how worthless I am, of you telling me because I wore a dress I'm a whore, because you telling me that I had a vagina, I am nothing more than a vagina. Your own father telling you this. And now I have to do so much. And then Six months after my father's diagnosis of Alzheimer's, my best friend, who I met at the age of 14, committed suicide. Mm. 
Mm. And he did this three days before my birthday. Um. And at this point, I got down on my knees and I said, God, mercy. I am going to break. I have no more sobor. I have no more tolerance. And if you break me at this point, it will be of no use, no good. I will have not learned anything from this pain to make good come out of it. And somehow God listened. And for five years I was a doubt. Just worked to care of my parents. Worked to care of my parents. Worked to care of my parents. I kept thinking, what is this sobor, this tolerance? What is this supposed to teach me? Because I still wasn't getting it. I'm tired of carrying all these pains, these burdens. And two weeks ago, Ma had a massive heart attack. Mm. And at first, we didn't know what was going on. The doctors in the ICU, in the emergency room, couldn't tell if it was her lungs or if it was her heart. And it was by the ninth hour in the ICU that the supervising nurse came to me and said, your mother's troponin level, that is an enzyme that the heart excretes when it's under extreme duress, is going up. All signs point to a heart. So it's at 9 o'clock at night. And all of a sudden, I realized this is where my tolerance is going to set me free. I have no control here. My mother, my, the love of my life, is on a ventilator. I was supposed to be a doctor, so I know all the signs to this. I know everything that you can possibly read out there on how to stop a stroke, how to stop cancer, how to stop blindness, how to deal with diabetes. But this heart attack, Ma is at the door of death, and there is nothing I can do other than open myself up. And at that moment when they said, this is a heart attack, I didn't cry, I didn't lose my shit, I didn't start cursing God. I said, whatever you do, I will accept. Mm -hmm. I will accept because I get it. I've been in practice all that time. This is it, this is the final act, I get it. This is where my wings are going to come <coughs> out. And this is where I spread my heart because it's about showing up. And I'm showing up for mom. I'm showing up for me. And I looked at my mother and I saw the son. And I saw myself in mom. And I am a son. And I realized I can pull mom back by the one thing that she has taught me over and over again. To God we belong and to God we will return. So I sat there and I held her hand and watched that blood pressure monitor. She was at 200, and that systolic had to come down to 140. 200, 180, and I held her hand, and there was a prayer I sang to her. Because I knew where my mother was going. She was going to this very dark place. Because my friend Harish went there when he committed suicide. And I know spiritually I searched for him in this dark place. And I knew what this dark place was. Because when I was being abused, I went to that dark place. Because I wanted to die. And my friend Harish, I know he went to that dark place because I searched for him for 10 years that he's been gone from my life. And now here I was again, at this precipice of life and death. And I didn't see death, I saw God. And I saw this beautiful light of mom. And I held her hand. The one prayer I kept praying to her, saying to her over and over again, is a prayer, the very first prayer in the Quran. And it talks about the might of God, how God is good, how God loves us, how God created these incredible things called universes that we still don't comprehend no matter how much science. And that if you choose good, you will be good. And if you choose bad, God will give you good, even if you choose bad. So the prayer goes a little like this, if you don't mind singing it.
whatever dark place she was in. Mom, come back to me. Mom, come back to me. I am here, Mom. I'm in Kurosaka's Iron Nakuma. I'm in Afa Hango Tassi. I'm right here, Mom. Just hear me, Mom. Just hear me, Mom. And that prayer over and over and over and over again, Mom came back. That pressure dropped down to 140. I got 10th hour of being in the ICU. I thought, I can go home now and I can take care of my father who has Alzheimer's. And then I can come back tomorrow. And I can do this all over again because Ma is here. Because if she wasn't here, that pressure would have never gone down. If she wasn't here, she would have not looked at me at that final hour and nodded and then went to sleep. And if she wasn't here, I would have never left that ICU here. And then the next morning, the cardiologist called me and told me, your mother has three collapsed veins, 80% occluded, closed. We have to go in. We have to see what we can do. Either we place a stent in to open up the veins, or we do open heart surgery, and we're going to do a bypass. And when he told me that, it was like the voice of God on the phone. Very plain, straight to the point. Didn't give me any adjectives, didn't flower it up. And when you hear that your mother is going to be cracked open, like I said, I'm pre-med, so I know what goes into that. And they're gonna cut my mother's heart, the temple I have been born from, the temple I called back to me. And I said, do what you have to do, doctor, to save my mother's life. And as soon as I got up on the phone, I fell to the floor and I said, God mercy. Mm -hmm. I have no more strength to give. I have no more tolerance. I am going to break. Please, I am humble before you. And this is the incredible power I have found. That when I get to these extreme moments of absolute strain, where I know I'm about to break, I am so humbled by that moment. I am cracked open to the universe, to whatever energy is going to come, whoever is going to come to my door, whoever is going to be there for me, or not. Preach. But what I have learned, that the most powerful thing I can do is to be there for myself, first and foremost. Yeah. And by doing that, I call whatever energy it is yeah. that I can call. Because this is the power I believe that God blessed me with that came from Ma, that came from her Ma, that came from her Ma, and her Ma, and the trees of Ma's that I come from. This is the power I come from. The ability to open up my arms and say, all right, universe, I am part of you. I am stardust, I am sun. What comes to me comes to you. What you give me, I give back. And I let everything go. And in doing so, within four days, I'm rehabilitated. She came home. Yes, it's been crazy. Yes, I'm losing my mind. Yes, I want to strangle my father at the end of the day. But I look at Mom, and I say, you know what, Mom? So what? Tolerance. Yeah. I freaking get, get it now. Because this is my strength. This is what makes us all come together, is this tolerance. And now I realize it's not a bad thing. All these years, my husband laying this foundation, this foundation, tolerance, who I am. And all those years I wasn't choosing to listen to her, became my strength. And it really has been able to let me walk my home. So be prepared for that as a daughter. Even with my father, to come to terms with this man who is one of the most detrimental forces in my life. And to say, okay, I can walk you home. Even if you're stabbing me in the back and putting salt on the wound, I'll walk your home. <laughs> so that's what I've learned. And I see this incredible thing tonight that I told Philip, I was like, you gotta love to tell my story. It's a hell of a terror. <laughs> what did I say, Power of Life? Um, get the fuck out of the way. Basically, and anyone that came, and I was always shocked with the family members that came into the ICU unit, and they were telling me their sorrows. The Girl, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. Like, no. my mother is having a heart attack. It's not about you. And I'm just like, but then I realized that I was a social worker. 
people grieve in different ways. And this is their way of grieving. They don't know how to say it the way I'm able to. Because I've learned this higher spiritual plane. That they would come to me, oh, my mother's having a Oh, my mother's dying. Oh, this person. I'm like, oh. But then I realized they're grieving too. And they didn't have to come to the hospital to see my mother. You know, so I, can I really knock them for that? They're grieving, they don't know how to relate to this. So in some weird way, I was showing up for them, even if we didn't know them. And in doing so, it really was able to give my strength to see, oh, people really need me here. I don't have to go away with just to come. So the deal with mom, I made to her now, mom, soborra, keep the tolerance, mom. Because you're going to get well enough, so you walk at my wedding. I'm not mad. That doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 mom walking at the wedding. Yeah. And then dancing at the wedding. Yeah. And that's what I learned about my power, is to have tolerance. Because it really is not limiting. It actually frees you. Absolutely, an incredible, genuine 
artist, individual. Um, Wait, where were they? Where were they saying I hosted? <laughs> Please put your hands together for the pain in the ass. <laughs> 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 Um, yes. This was like, this was like, I don't remember. <laughs> um, I have a question. Anyone make bubblegum on him at all? Bubblegum? Or Ken? What do you mean that? You're not open. No? Need some sugar. Don't do it. <laughs> I may have a mental. Oh, no. I I mean, know, you know. Why? I said, I said I need sugar. You were like, "Come on, everybody know this." I was thinking stuff, but I didn't see. You're worse than my kids, man. Like a kind of poor kid. No, seriously, I need some grandma. I can't do it. I'm not diabetic, but I eat a lot. I eat a lot. I'm not Christian, but Jesus loves you. <laughs> this is sugar free. <laughs> So um, when I was younger, I would lay on my bed, literally, I up to four or five, lay on my bed, and I would look at myself on my bed from the corner of my room. And I thought it was normal for people to leave their body fly around everyone but naked and look at themselves. <laughs> 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 um, I didn't know what it was called. I just knew it. I had a skill set. And I knew it so much to it. I went to the hospital the day my mother's mother died. And I was confused. Like, what are you crying about? She's standing right there. Look at her. She's not crying about someone's in the room. I drank, I smoked, I fought. So all those things, as you do them, start to they deteriorate. You don't even lose them. But you deteriorate, they become less than what they're actually worth. But I remember one time sitting on Lincoln Place with a really pretty witch. And um, she, seriously, her family were a uh, family of witches, the complete book and they're from um, Guyana, Georgetown, Guyana. And to impress her, I would tell her what color car was going to come down the street. And I was always right. She thought it was cute. And basically patted me on my head. <laughs> and I used that ability for sometimes the various reasons. Like I would know when a cop would come in and I was selling drugs and I would leave all the time before the cop showed up. I knew when to go. I would tell the other dumb motherfuckers they wouldn't do it. <laughs> I never saw jail. I knew what happened in the turnstile, how to hop it, when to hop it, what turnstile to hop, because I could see them before they happened. Mm. Or I could in tune with him for him. Mm -hmm. Even being an athlete, I was always a really good, I was basically DPOI and was going to be was defensive player of the year. Because I can always tell what a player is about to do next. I can, but it was my ability that I had as a kid. And I realized later on that my mother had it, my grandmother had it on the side. We were a family, we were, had a, I guess you would call it clairvoyance or ESP. Who want to move forward? Today I'm getting ready come over here. And I started this rule about a year ago. Because people die. It's this thing people do. They just die. It's in the real shit. They just live and die. So people have been dying. And I'm like, missing people and not knowing you're dead. Like literally oh. like, Hey, how's your husband? He's dead. Oh. <laughs> right. So after the second time it happened, I realized that when someone pops in my head, I had to remember that it was part of the second site. I need to call this person. It wasn't always something bad. Sometimes it was not called them. I literally just, no bullshit, it happened in January. Someone popped in my head, my homegirl Jan, I gave her a call, and I made $10,000. Mm. So I was like, this is a really good wow. habit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, today, getting dressed, going through my phone, because I counted some of my clients and, and my agent. My friend, I never hopped in my head. I said, I'm going to call her when I get to my house. Get to my house, took my shower, do everything you do when you leave the house. Walk around the house, but nigga. I call another. I'm talking on that. I'm scared. I called her, she didn't answer. I'm like, hmm, I'm usually. Anyway, whatever. Good dress. 
She called me back from her head, and her voice is completely not the right voice. So me being an asshole, I am like, what are you doing? Or what are you, who are you doing it with? This is me. <laughs> but I can tell something's not right. She told me she's feeling, this is a that words, I'm feeling suicidal. Mm. Now, good tangent. I do wellness work. Most of my art is about wellness. They were women, children, and um, <laughs> even the book I have out, even the book I have out now is about trauma and pulling people away from their trauma and emerging into self love and self care. So when someone does that, I know what to do next. Quickly go into psychology mode. Because my degree was supposed to be in psychology, but I never finished it. So that was conversation with her. I started to divert the conversation to why she's that way. I actually don't want her to not talk about it. I want her to go deep into why she wants to kill herself. What if the fuck is happening in your life that a fine six foot woman wants to kill herself? Mm -hmm. We're having this conversation, we're talking about it, deep into the conversation, and she's telling me that she lost her man, she feels like she's a loser, nothing's working with her life. And of course, being a dick that I am, I divert the conversation to the dick and pussy conversation. I used to sleep with her. So I'm like, all right, go on. She's saying she's not working anything. Anything she touches doesn't work out. I'm like, I don't know. Last time we were in a hotel room, she worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> I get the first giggle. We're making progress. She's talking more about what happened with her. She explains to me how she had a great man, but what happened to her in her past is fucking up her present. So we talked about the present. I said, right, let's, do a, let's do a totality table. You are a teacher. Let's do, let's, let's do a logic board. You got some kids. How old are you now? Your age. All right, that's positive. You're annoying kid. She's out there annoying age now, ain't she? Man, you know. That's why I got three of them up I know what this shit is. <laughs> that's positive. Do you have your health? I mean, not right now, the pills you took. But I'll have the pills you took. Because you don't feel nothing before. No, it's a serious thing. Because literally, Sorry, she is the killer player. <laughs> and I actually made a, I made a joke about her. I I, I get you. I should tell right now. So I made a joke about that. She's like, yo, I'm taking these pills. I should be drowsy by now. I said, well, you're full of adrenaline because you're scared. You're taking the pills. And you're also six foot in your voluptuous. This should be working for me. So anyway, let's go tell you something. The next one was like, youngest child. How they doing? School working out well? Yes. The last part was the most important part. Are you hurt? Yes. Do when someone's hurt, what do they do? Do they off themselves or do they fix the hurt? Conversation continues. Now she stopped laughing at herself. Now we continue there. I realize the only good jokes I have with her about sex. So all my jokes literally read to something sexual. Not because I want her anymore, though I never front and that back. Right. So we can take them, don't you? Anyway, what I realized to move this conversation forward now pro properly, I have to convince her to not take the next phase. What I didn't know though, the kids were announced. Mm -hmm. She's telling me that she's in a lot. Her closet was the walk-in closet. I remember how else it was. So she had to come out of her closet to get to home. Good steps. Now she's laughing, she's out of the closet, she's on her own bed, and now we're talking about her children. I find out the kids are now, one of the kids comes in the room and asks her why we crying. She tells her a story about stomach hurting and some like that. So I tell her, the stomach is actually hurting. You're taking three pills from that, so you're actually hurting. She laughs again, the kid's like, why are you laughing? My friend is sleeping on the phone. Her energy beginning to change. I started thinking about what I could tell her when she was with me. So with her as well, I remember I told her that I was able to pick her out of the room before I walked in. She's like, oh, he goes that mumbo jumbo. <laughs> You're right, but I also knew the corner. I didn't have to call She then tells me that while she was taking her pills, she was hoping that something would tell her what happened next. I said, here's your, here's your next. My dumb ass call, now you send your family with you. Next part of the conversation. My oldest daughter walks in and wants to hear that. So I ask her, who's going to do her hair today? She 
gets quiet. She's like, all right, make me a coin, get you a coin, get you a coin. So what I realized, for the longest time, I've been running around the world, believing, and that's not actually so, that I can do things with my mind. I call it Jedi mind trick. I've convinced people to do shit they never thought they'd do. How many people here are over 35? How many of you dumb motherfuckers had a two-way picture? Oh, what? A two-way picture back in the numbers. The little blue bullshit. We convinced you to do that. Uh, I'll find it. And it didn't work after a month, did it? Exactly. I was on a team that convinced your dumb ass to buy a fucking two-way picture. They're saying the evidence is evidence. <laughs> and so all my life, I've been running around, even with my art. I know that I can convince someone in this room to cry out my heart. It's not a question. Cry. I do it every fucking day. Literally. I make people laugh. They're not going to. I walk into spaces where I'm the only black person. I have everyone in the room completely compelled into a story that has nothing to do with that. I'm in the opposite, in a black space. It's the ability to see what's in the room and then join to it and make it work for itself. Now, I can use, I've done it for many people. <coughs> I got an ass off it, I saw jumps off it, I got people about dumb two way pages. It's really not a bad thing to do. But after this conversation, I really realized that my real power, in this case, didn't help. It was listening. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really about almost everything. Just clap your hands, girl. It's not, not the green mile. We clap hands. But <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't know about that? So, <laughs> the reason why I'm using that thing is that I'm doing is that um, <laughs> Brooklyn Moon and Queen Mile were two ways to start it. In both cases, there were people living in both the venues who told the owners, I'm gonna fuck y'all up, they keep fucking strapping hands with y'all, like, it's too loud. And Book the Moon, the dude was my size and a lawyer. He's like, I will fuck you up and sue you. So I need you to stop this fucking clapping shit coming in the way. And that's where all the snaps are doing this problem. There's nothing to do with it. And of course, the beat is he does. Snap all you want. Ah, it's not for me. I clap for you. I'm, I'm, I'm bigger than you. Don't listen to me. I don't want to get the clap for you. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. It was, it was kind of overwhelming to realize that what I normally do to get someone to change their mind was not going to be the most important thing. The most important thing in this case was to listen. Not listen to agree, but listen to get them to see where they need to be. The other times you find yourself talking to someone, and the first thing human beings, especially Western Europeans and Western Americans, we want to convince someone of something. Even how we market things here in we convince people to do things. You need to go shopping at Walmart. You need to have this insurance. You need to have this sneaker. You need to see this thing. <coughs> when sometimes it's really just about finding out what people need to pull for themselves, and they'll tell you what they need. By the time we heard our first conversation, I decided to come here. Um, her ex-husband came to get one of the kids. And she started to tell me about school. At that point, I realized, okay, we, we, there's no more pilgrimage there. She's thinking about school. She's talking about how she has a new staff coming in. She's fretting over the students coming in, hoping that all the boards are done. She's worried about security for the week, because there's always a bunch, there's always one idiot that comes from high school, that's an idiot. And she changed places, and she's not sure if kid, you know, how the hell the new angles, and new locks and doors. It's done. But it wasn't me. Really, I'm, I can I'm say it's God, but it's the ability to sit there and listen to someone and find out what they actually need versus me thinking that I can help change the situation. That's what's wrong. Yes. Which actually, what Lydia is about being in that space 
and well, let me phrase that, being in this space to receive. Yeah. Because if you can't receive anything, the best part of communication is actually receive. Um, the calm part, they don't say, uh, they don't use, they, they call the calm really is about receiving information and then replying back to you. If you can't do that part, then everything else is lost. And the trick to listening is that you don't take it on as your energy. Right. Sometimes, you gotta be like Neo and Matrix, dodge that shit. Right. You know what I'm right. Just be present. Yeah, you know, I'm here, I can hold this for you for the time being, but, you know, it's very hard to shift that energy out. Sometimes you can absorb it, but sometimes the pain of a stranger can haunt you, or in your own pain. So just be careful of that. When you listen to people, remember that this is their problem, they're just sharing with you. It is not your own problem. And so, to give us two snaps up for the snap. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to say, so the reason why in my community we snap is because we don't want to disturb the energy of the speaker. Yes. And the clapping sound is a sharp sound, which is good at the end. No, I love that. You love it? All right. And so <laughs> what, <laughs> yeah, people who are, who are speaking in us and you're like, you know, in a group of larger people, snap to give people their props to say I feel you, I hear you and not to interrupt the energy when you see the energy flowing. I can do that. That's why I tell people for me, because I'm 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 a hand person. No, no, not you. No. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> What's next month? Yeah. Hey, you yeah. feel that. Next month's theme is. Who doesn't have any more? Next month's theme is next month's theme is Sanctuary. Refuge. Now, if there are any people who want to tell a story, you come and speak to Shavina and I, and we will get you on the list. Yes. Um, but we appreciate everyone for showing yes. up today. Thank you so much. Thank you.
seriously. And I want to buy some of these. Nice. You have to get back to like, you know, you start making them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.